Just before the video begins, please subscribe and like the videos to help the channel grow. Also, leave a comment, good, bad, or indifferent. Thanks for watching. Why do you downgrade acting as a profession? What? Hey, Stella! You made some great movies in the very beginning. I didn't make any great movies. There's no such thing as a great movie. You know? Never mind that, why we do. We haven't much time. Marlon Brando is perhaps the actor most associated with the method, a style of acting associated with realism and emotion taken from experiences in one's life which brought a new type of performance to Hollywood. His turbulent career saw him win Oscars and be nominated for Razzie Awards. Critics praised and panned him throughout his acting life. I've gathered together information from various biographies of his life and I'll be talking about various times in Brando's life, his family, his behaviour as an actor, his behaviour as a person. What's the matter? You, you don't dig rat? Marlon Brando Jr. was born in Omaha, Nebraska on April 3rd, 1924 to two alcoholic parents. His mother was named Dorothy Pennebaker and his father Marlon Brando. They called the young Marlon Bud to distinguish him between his father. His mother, known as Dodie, was unconventional for her time. She smoked cigarettes, wore pants and drove cars. An actress herself and a theatre administrator, she helped Henry Fonda begin his acting career. Marlon developed an ability to absorb the mannerisms of children he played with and displayed them dramatically while staying in character. He was introduced to neighbourhood boy Wally Cox and the two were the closest of friends. In his autobiography, Songs My Mother Taught Me, Brando expressed sadness when writing about his mother. The anguish that her drinking produced was that she preferred getting drunk to caring for us. Eventually, Dodie and Marlon Sr. attended Alcoholics Anonymous. My father was a drunk. My mother was very, very poetic and also a drunk. Brando struggled with rage most of his life, and with his rage, darkness and despair were never far away. One subject that would quickly turn Marl into rage was his father. I imagine you're just a bit proud of your son right now, aren't you? Well, as an actor, not too proud, but as a man, why, quite proud. Well, I really don't feel I need to defend myself. I can lick this guy with one hand, so... Uh... <laughs> I was his namesake, but nothing I did ever pleased or interested him. He enjoyed telling me I couldn't do anything right. He had a habit of telling me I would never amount to anything, Brando later said. As he got older, his explosive anger came faster and more furious. He threw paint over a friend's wall when it was being remodeled. He carried a knife and slashed tires. He shot his BB gun out of the street from his house. By high school, he was stealing money from neighbors' houses. When asked years later where his rage came from, he answered, from childhood. When Marlin was 15, his father brought home a drunk Dodie. In a rage, Marlin Sr. hit his mother who fell to the floor crying. Marlin ran into the room and threatened the older Brando, if you touch her again, I will kill you. Whether it was through remorse or not, the older man backed down. Otherwise, Brando later said, I would have killed him. There's no question in my mind. At an acting workshop soon after, Brando punched a fellow actor in the mouth for touching his crotch. His teachers despaired of him and his high school headmaster referred to him as a bum and good for nothing. His mother Dodie told him if he wanted to be an actor he'd have to spend many years studying the craft but Marlin Sr. saw acting as no career path. Stella Adler would be the biggest influence on Marlin's acting. She taught him that everybody acts every day. If Stella saw one of her students consciously trying to play a part she would shout, stop acting. Stella would burst into her acting workshops like an actor appearing on stage. You must listen with your blood, she would shout. She called Marlin an imaginative young man. 
When Marlin went to visit his mother, he brought his girlfriend along and told her there must be no talk of drinking. He never said why, but it was understood. Brando's first screen role was a bitter paraplegic veteran in The Men. He spent a month in the Birmingham Army Hospital to prepare for the role. Early in his career, Brando began using cue cards instead of memorising his lines. Despite the objections of several of the film directors he worked with, Brando felt this helped bring realism and spontaneity to his performances. Brando brought his performance as Stanley Kowalski to the screen in Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire. The role is regarded as one of Brando's greatest. It earned him his first Academy Award nomination in the Best Actor category. He was nominated the next year for Viva Zapata, a fictionalized account of the life of Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata. Brando's next film, Julius Caesar, received highly favorable reviews. While most acknowledge Brando's talent, some critics felt Brando's mumbling and other idiosyncrasies betrayed a lack of acting fundamentals. In 1953, Brando also starred in The Wild One, riding his own Triumph Thunderbird. The film was criticized for its perceived gratuitous violence. After the movie's release, the sales of leather jackets and motorcycles skyrocketed. In 1954, Brando starred in On the Waterfront, a crime drama film about union violence and corruption amongst longshoremen. Brando went on to win the Oscar for this role. Following On the Waterfront, Brando remained a top box office draw, but critics increasingly felt his performances were half-hearted, lacking the intensity and commitment found in his earlier work especially in his work, Viva Zapata. He portrayed Napoleon in his next role but put little effort into it. He didn't like the script and later dismissed the entire movie as superficial and dismal. Guys and Dolls would be Brando's first and last musical. Time found the picture false to its original feeling, remarking that Brando sings in a faraway tenor that sometimes tends to be flat. In an interview in early 1955, he admitted to having problems with his singing voice, which he called pretty terrible. The film was commercially, but not critically successful. In 1958, Brando appeared in The Young Lions, dyeing his hair blonde and assuming a German accent for the role, which he later admitted was not convincing. I thought the story should demonstrate that there are no inherently bad people in the world, but they can easily be misled. Brando later stated. In 1961, Brando made his directorial debut in the Western One-Eyed Jacks. The picture was originally directed by Stanley Kubrick, but he was fired early in the production. Paramount thereafter made Brando the director. The film soon went over budget. Paramount expected the film to take three months to complete, but shooting stretched to six and the cost doubled to more than six million dollars. Brando's inexperience as an editor also delayed post-production and Paramount eventually took control of the film. Brando later wrote, The studio cut the movie to pieces. By then I was bored with the whole project and walked away from it. One-Eyed Jax was received with mixed reviews by critics. On November 28, 1962, shooting for Mutiny on the Bounty began. When Marlin arrived in Tahiti, the local people greeted him warmly. He spent Christmas Day eating taro root and raw fish marinated in coconut milk, as well as a pig slow roasted over a fire pit. He sat around with the Tahitians listening to their stories and playing along with their music. They don't care who you are, they don't care what you do or what you represent. As long as you're decent, courteous, and generally kind, he said. The kindness especially impressed him. One time he was on the beach watching a group of fishermen and they gave him a basket of fish for no reason. Another time he had a flat tire and a man came along, fixed the tire, didn't say one word, and drove off. In the middle of breakfast, lunch, or even while filming, Brando would go out in a canoe with a 10 pound box of ice cream and sometimes not come back until sunset. Marlin saw the script for Mutiny on the Bounty was in very bad shape and he took upon it himself to rewrite the scenes when needed. I'm taking command of this ship. 
He went through Frank Lederer's script at breakfast with coconut bread and hot tea. The pages he liked he put to one side and the pages he didn't he tore up. He loathed Clark Gable's portrayal in the 1935 adaptation, stating he hadn't even bothered to speak with an English accent. He carried around a Tahitian dictionary everywhere he went and soon picked up the language. Not only did the film nearly capsize MGM, it also capsized Brando's career. He manipulated directors constantly. He would deliberately give nine bad takes, then give a good take so that one was printed. He also enjoyed playing pranks on his colleagues. When filming The Young Lions, Brando stayed face down in water for one minute after the director yelled cut. A panic ensued and then he rose to his feet. During The Godfather, he filled a hospital bed with bricks before a group of men carried it up a flight of stairs. By the early 70s, Brando was a pariah and box office poison. But after his performance in The Godfather, his stock would once again rise. Already getting pudgy before The Godfather, he gained additional weight for the role, pounds he would find very difficult to lose. Not to mention Marlon's occasional Valium use was growing by the day. With the success of The Godfather, Marlin was offered all sorts of parts. Radio, magazines and television were all trying to land an interview with him. Marlin and his on-again, off-again girlfriend Jill Banner checked themselves into a small hotel in Santa Fe. He planned to go cold turkey from the Valium that had kept his moods even. It was a promise he'd made to Jill when they got back together, but it didn't work. He was going through nightmare withdrawals and after a few days he couldn't stand it. A friend later said, you name it, it was happening to him. He returned home and doctors prescribed him smaller dosages in order to wean him down slowly. In 1973, his childhood friend Wally Cox died of a heart attack. Brando was devastated. Wally's widow asked Marlin to scatter his ashes, but when she gave them to him, he refused, intending that they be scattered with his own when the time came. A fight then ensued over Wally's ashes, but in the end it was felt Brando needed them more. I'm not sure whether I'll ever forgive Wally for dying, he said. For a long time afterwards, he would curse Wally for leaving him. Food was always a friend, Marlin said. He had progressively been gaining weight since the 60s. According to his personal assistant, Alice Marchak, he battled with the eating disorder bulimia. She reveals how, despite his physical stature, the star regularly gorged on food only to vomit it back up in secret. She stated, we'd eat dinner and then Marlin would go to the bathroom and come back and order another meal. She claims she discovered his bulimia when she found him passed out in a bathroom after having hemorrhaged. When shooting Apocalypse Now, Brando arrived on set overweight and he wanted to camouflage that fact. But director Francis Ford Coppola wanted to incorporate this into his character, seeing Colonel Kurtz as a man overindulging in everything, constantly eating. A former employee said in later years he insisted his refrigerator be padlocked to stop his food binges, but Brando would call the local McDonald's and have them toss bags of food over his fence. The next day his employee would come to work and see empty ice cream cartons and wrappers for Big Macs. His biographer George England recalled him saying, It's an addiction, it's like drugs or booze. Sometimes he would go on these diets eating only with chopsticks and I knew after I'd left he'd be down at Ralph's in the ice cream department. Christian Brando was born May 11th, 1958, the product of an affair between Marlon Brando and Anna Cashfee, an actress born to a British family in Colombia. Marlin and Cashfee met in 1955 and Cashfee became pregnant in 1957. They married in 1958 and divorced one year later. Christian was shuttled between his mother and father. His parents became increasingly hostile and abusive towards each other and engaged in a protected custody battle. 
The 12 year custody battle and his mother's uncontrollable temper due to her abuse of drugs and alcohol had a major effect on young Christian. In 1972, while his father was abroad filming Last Tango in Paris, Christian was kidnapped by his mother who took him from school then brought him to a gang of hippie friends in California, Mexico. Apparently she had promised them 10,000 if they would hide Christian away. When she refused to pay, they took and hid the boy. A posse of private detectives was hired by Brando. The agency they worked for was named The Investigators. They rescued him late one night. He was found living in a tent and ill with bronchial pneumonia. His mother was arrested near the Mexican border after being pulled over for drunk driving and disorderly behavior. No kidnapping charges were brought to Anna as she was his legal guardian, not even child endangerment. Brando was enraged. Anna by this point was a hopeless alcoholic, just like Brando's own mom had been. She had placed Christian's life in danger all because of her obsessive need to see Marlin lose. The two returned to France to finish filming Last Tango in Paris and Brando promised Christian you will never have to feel afraid again. During his teen years, Christian dropped out of high school and began drinking and using LSD. He was an occasional actor, but was not very interested in being in the spotlight. At the time, Marlin described his son as a basket case of emotional disorder. Marlin was a distant father and spent little time with young Christian, who was raised by nannies and servants. Marlin continued to have relationships with multiple women. Years later, while commenting on his childhood, Christian said, The family kept changing shape. I'd sit down at the breakfast table and say, Who are you? On May 16th, 1990, Christian fatally shot Dag Drolet, the boyfriend of his half-sister Cheyenne in the living room of his father's house in Beverly Hills, California. Both Dag and Cheyenne were staying at Brando's house at the time. Christian had only met Dag for the first time several hours before he shot him to death. Hours before the killing, Cheyenne had told Christian that Drolet had been physically abusive towards her. Later, around 11pm that night, Christian, who admitted to being drunk at the time, confronted Drolet and shot him. In court, Marlin watched on in pain as Christian stood trial. When he took the stand to testify, he was as difficult and rebellious as he was on the movie set. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So have you done? No, I will not swear on God. And uh, you ask these guys to shut up. No matter what the scenario, Marlin was going to do things his way. I think perhaps I failed as a father, Marlin stated, choking back tears. He saw the trial as the result of everything Christian had suffered in his early years. Christian was initially charged with murder. However, prosecutors were unable to proceed with a murder charge because of the absence of Cheyenne, she being a crucial witness to their case. Marlon Brando had admitted Cheyenne into a psychiatric hospital in Tahiti. After several attempts to get her to California, a judge eventually quashed all efforts by the prosecution. Without Cheyenne's testimony, prosecutors felt they could no longer prove that Drolet's death was premeditated. Therefore, Christian was not charged with first degree murder and presented with a plea deal. Christian was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He would serve five years. Cheyenne attempted suicide twice during the trial. Then in 1995, a year before Christian was released from prison, she committed suicide by hanging herself at her mother's house in Tahiti. After Christian was released from prison, he found a job as a welder. Over the next eight years, Marlin and Christian saw each other rarely. During the years Christian lived in rural Washington, he became seriously addicted to crystal meth. He sank further into drug addiction and died of pneumonia in 2008. He was 49 years old. He was Marlon Brando's number one son, an heir to the actor's 20 million estate, but he died penniless hooked on crystal meth. 
Many believe Christian never recovered from the trauma of his early life. In the fights between Marlin and Anna, he was always collateral damage. George England, Marlin's oldest friend, later said, There's an old saying, when two elephants fight, the grass is wounded. That's the way I see Christian. He was the wounded ground on which two ferocious elephants fought all those years. After the trial of Christian Brando, Marlin returned home to the refuge of the Hollywood Hills. There he fell into a deep depression. He blamed himself for everything, a friend said. He and Jill had separated after numerous affairs. Before Marlin could patch things up, Jill was killed in a car crash. Brando was inconsolable. In Paris, Cheyenne was on suicide watch in hospital. Marlin flew over to be with her. According to others, Cheyenne's well-being became Marlin's whole world. But eventually, just like his mother, he couldn't save her. Cheyenne hanged herself on April 16, 1995. Marlin had tried to make his children's life so much better than his own, but they had turned out so much worse. Marlin began regular psychotherapy sessions which lasted years. He was always looking for ways to calm his mind, a friend said. At this point, Brando saw acting in films as a means to a financial end, and he hated working on all of them. He might have enjoyed working on Don Juan DeMarco, said a friend. And indeed, some moments in the film seem to mirror his life. Yeah. You're right, my, uh, my world is... Not perfect. Now you want us to pay you $430 for the time it took you not to figure out what's wrong. Keep looking if you want. But it's $65 an hour. Jack. Well, I pay it, pay the guy. Pay it? Where were you just now? El Mexico. I think the fact that he had to make these films took the fun out of doing them, Everett Douglas said. After the age of 50, Brando was able to control his rage. He was pretty quiet most of the time, Douglas said. Only when making a film would he explode. There was always a blow up on set, so he chose big budget epics. Superman earned him 3.7 million. All he needed to do was show up, display his techniques for the camera, then he could collect his paycheck and go home. He had hated acting ever since Last Tango in Paris, but Marlin never lost his skill, and despite what critics say, none of his performances were throwaway. Every time he was on screen, there was something. In 1994, CNN interviewer Larry King showed up at Brando's home for an hour-long interview. The interview was to promote Marlin's autobiography, Songs My Mother Taught Me. Brando did his own makeup, and during the interview fed his dog treats from his own mouth, sat barefoot, and sang a duet with King before kissing him on the mouth. Titiaroa, the private island Brando had bought years earlier, became his sanctuary. There he experimented with eco-friendly ideas, such as using the cold seawater to air condition a hotel on the island. After the score in 2001, Marlin made no further films, but his mind never stopped. He was forever coming up with new ideas. He began an acting workshop called Lying for a Living he planned to release on home DVD. He wrote a couple of screenplays which nothing came of. Diagrams and detailed drawings documented his ingenuity. Some of his ideas were drawn precisely to scale. One device rocked babies to sleep by mimicking the movement of an automobile. Another idea was that of an earthquake-proof house. He drew hundreds of pictures of men, women and children of all ages and races. He asked his friend to teach him how to use Photoshop and then spent hours moving the sunset around creating different realities from photographs. He recited poetry as he walked around his house and he would often recite Shakespeare. Brando purchased one of the first Apple computers and became fascinated with the internet. He encouraged all his staff to use the information superhighway, as he called it, and spent hours in AOL chat rooms 
getting into political arguments with strangers. Frequently his account was suspended for ending arguments by telling others to F off. Avrid Douglas remembered, so many times I had to call AOL and say, that was my kid and he'll never do it again. He used fax machines constantly. He'd send drawings, cartoons and magazine articles. Ellen Adler stated, at the end of his life Marlin would just talk on the phone. Nobody in to see him, but he'd talk on the phone for three hours at a time. He recorded himself speaking on tapes planning to make a film about his life but this never came to fruition. Listen to Me Marlin was released in 2015. The aim was for the documentary to be made with the vision he had. In his final months he was cared for by his Filipino housekeeper and devoted companion. His eyesight was fading and he'd been diagnosed with liver cancer. He lost half his body weight and on July 1st 2004 Marlon Brando died. He was 80 years old. His ashes were scattered with wallies in Death Valley just as he'd wanted. To tell every interesting story in Brando's life would be endless, or to analyse or explain his actions would be subjective. Just like his acting, Marlon Brando's character was complicated. <laughs>